thing ready to go that, um, yeah, hey folks, thank you for joining me today. Show prep, man, did I spend some time doing that. Uh, let me start out by telling you, man, I my heart was broken when Kobe Bryant passed, um, and now Rush Limbaugh, a guy I really have a lot of respect for. Um, he He's an icon. I don't care how you feel about him, the guy's an icon, 30-some years of doing this. Can I tell you, if Doug Kaufman had to announce yesterday on his program, and I don't think we're at 30 million people a day watching, I'd like to think we're at, you know, 10% of that, and I announce to you, listen, I come to you today with a heavy heart, I have advanced stage lung cancer, it started with a little, <clears throat> you know, coughing and so forth, and it's progressively gotten worse. And I went to the doctor and remember who I am. You know, I have all the connections, the best insurance and so forth. So I go to the best doctors. And uh, these doctors told me that I have lung cancer. Now, I don't know Rush Limbaugh. I know he's a cigar aficionado. Uh, he probably enjoys a glass of wine now and again. I don't, I, I really don't know him. I wish I did because I'd probably step off the, the uh, comfort zone step into the uncomfortable zone step and call them. Long shot, I know. Folks, when you have cancer, diabetes, any autoimmune disease, you are blessed with friends. They come out of the woodworks. They might be a nurse at the hospital. They might be a friend at church. They might be somebody you're in school with. <clears throat> everybody cares, and everybody has their own nutrition story, uh, especially this audience. We're here because we believe uh, that there's something to the food God put on this earth to nurture us, and then the components of food. We're going to talk about one in a minute here called flavanol because it seems to be working for Alzheimer's patients. Gee, why would flavanol? You know where I'm going here. <clears throat> if I were a Rush Limbaugh, I'd go see a friend of mine who's a, uh, a pulmonologist and an internal medicine doctor. He's got both uh, qualifications. He's out here locally in Texas. I would have him do a bronchoscopy on me. Not that there's anything wrong with the other five to 12,000 pulmonologists, but they do bronchoscopy to look for you know, bacteria. They don't do it to look for fungus. This one, now after subscribing to my theory for a few years here, is on fire. He's finding 70, 80% of all his bronchoscopies have fungus. Yet the common pulmonologist, Russia's pulmonologist, if they do a bronchoscopy on him, will say, yeah, oh man, look at those bacteria. What is this word here? Fusarium? Uh, he needs an antibiotic. Um, so I'd go locally, I'd land a DFW and go to my friend and get a bronchoscopy. <clears throat> Just takes, they anesthetize you for it, lay you on a table, put your head back and go into your lungs with a little tube and uh, take little samples. <clears throat> my friend has found that a huge number of those samples are fungal. Huge. I think he told me one patient had seven or eight different fungi. We tend to think, well, aspergillus, because that's in our ducting system. We tend to think candida, because that's kind of a commensal. God put it there in our mucus, or in certain areas of our mucous membrane. But it can be activated with antibiotics, etc. So I'd get a bronchoscopy. I'd have isolated the fungi. I would begin to take, fill in the blank, I Spornox. Many doctors tell me, I've communicated with a few of my doctor friends, <clears throat> say, wonder if they're going to try fenbendazole. Fenbendazole is a canine medication dewormer that's hitting home runs. That which kills worms kills fungi. It's hitting home runs for some people with cancer. And the, I like the medical community. They're saying, okay, let's try this. Let's give this a go. Um, I would change, if I were Rush, I would organic green apple, carrot, ginger, kale, till the cows came home. I would put myself into a state of ketosis, not ketoacidosis. I know that could kill you, uh, diabetics, be careful, but ketosis, uh, where I'm beginning to eat my own fat in my body instead of living off sugars, carbs for energy. <clears throat> I would change, you guys. I'm not the kind of guy who would 
go in blindly. God bless this man. He's so intelligent, but he's going to the best doctors likely. And the best doctors didn't get to be the top dogs, the chair of the departments at these hospitals or medical facilities by prescribing IV vitamin C. They got there by prescribing chemo, radiation, following what their, stu what their teachers taught them in medical school 38 years ago. Does it work? Well, what are the stats, guys? I'm Rush Limbaugh. What are the stats? I want to know, can you just give me 15 names from your files of people with the exact advanced stage 3 or 4, whatever it is, cancer, who thanks to your chemotherapy and your approach are alive today, 5 to 10 years later? All I want is 15 names. Oh, you don't? 10 names. Serious? Can I have five names? You see where I'm going with this. Sometimes, folks, I have to wonder if those of us who are not celebrities in our own right, who are not wealthy, don't get better results than the celebrities. Because they see the top doctors. Okay? I'm telling you, antifungal, folks, when your lungs, now I don't know, I know Rush loves cigars. I see him as a guy who, after golf, goes to the 19th hole. How many holes are there in golf? 16 or 18, something. 18, thanks. Go to the 19th hole, I think that's called a bar, and down a couple of drinks with his buddies, drive home, maybe swim for, I, I don't know. But if there is alcohol, I just read a report that said the two most predisposing criteria for cancer are gender and alcohol. If you're a male, you tend to have a higher risk of cancer. And if you're a male who consumes more than what doctors call moderate drinking, a couple drinks a day, um, that turns out to be 68 gallons of beer a year, two cans of beer a day. So if you drink more than that, and being a male, then you're more vulnerable to this disease called cancer makes total sense to me unless you misunderstood that alcohol is a pleasure drink. It's not, guys. I don't know, at some time in your life, you might look at this seriously. John and I were talking about it at lunch today. Uh, um, you know, I, I wish America would stop drinking. First thing I think would happen, in two months, we'd feel much, much better. Our need for medications would begin to go down. Then our need to visit doctors regularly would go down. It doesn't work within some systems, but it sure works in other systems. Okay, now, so that's what I would do. Fenbendazole, Spornox, bronchoscopy. <clears throat> See, I'd want to know, could a guy that wealthy live in a moldy home? Usually, it's the extremely wealthy that do live in a moldy home. I got a phone call from <clears throat> a very famous person you would know. This famous person, uh, his wife told me that they had an MTV home. And I didn't know what an MTV, I had to call my sons, what's an MTV home? Uh, and this MTV home was riddled with mold and they both got really sick. And so her uh, doctor in Florida said, you got to call Doug Kaufman. And I spoke with her. The money that these people have, very famous guy, you all would know him. Um, the money these people have is unbelievable. But if your doctors, fortunately her doctor did, he's a friend of mine. Um, if, if you don't know fungus, you don't know good health. Welcome to Know the Cause. By the way, let me just read you this. Um, Damon just gave me this. Alzheimer's disease. This is a good place to start. John, do you have that camera on me, whatever camera this is, on me? Can you see that? More flavanol, less Alzheimer's. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Oh, maybe six months ago, Dr. Josh Levitt, I don't know if you know him, this guy was cool. Um, he came here and interviewed me, a uh, big group, they thought they were interviewing the 
10 or 15 most prominent Alzheimer's people in America till they got here. They interviewed me and got my take on Alzheimer's. Uh, Dr. Josh then uh, uh, was working for this huge company. They put this together and they're gonna put a, a series on Alzheimer's on your telephone, on uh, Facebook, on the internet. <clears throat> It's called Escaping Alzheimer's, a video series that addresses the underlying causes of as well as the life-saving tools to prevent an epidemic that we call Alzheimer's disease. Now, one of the things we're finding, this is an evolving field, folks. Nobody knows. Here, just recently, this came out when? A couple of days ago. More flavanol, less Alzheimer's. <clears throat> Save the dates, Escaping Alzheimer's. It starts February 18th. On our website right now, you can subscribe. Uh, you know my rotating banner? There's, hey, Frank and Mark of NSC, congratulations, thank you for 20 years of advertising. And then there's my book rotation. Well, we just added another rotation up there. Uh, it's Escaping Alzheimer's. Go and sign up at knowthecause.com. The link is on our rotating banner on the main page, on our front page. Do sign up. I, I think you'll like that. Was it this one or another one recently? I think they used me in the, uh, in the pilot program. I think they used me uh, in the opening and it was kind of fun. You know, I do quite a few of these. It's an honor. I am blessed to be asked by these organizations to do this. Folks, they don't see me as a doctor because I'm not one. They see me as one of you. One of you who, when I look at my diet, when I don't exercise for three days, which I've just come off of, and I was with the grandkids, whoo, uh, correction. When you're with grandkids, you exercise full time. I didn't do my normal routine like I did this afternoon. Um, and you wonder, it's 70 years old, I have to wonder. I don't have Alzheimer's in my family, but they say it can skip patterns, skip lines, and you can end up with it. Folks, I think we drink it. I think we swallow it in pill form. I think we eat it. And I think we have become accustomed to living a sedentary lifestyle when that's the most exercise that many of us get. Uh, my wife and I got a, uh, uh, one of these bikes. It's not the big one. It's the next one. It's not the Peloton. It was the next one down. Expensive. But boy, she is loving that thing. And I mean, she's on that every day, going up hills in Italy and down. And John, what's that machine that... Um, they made the skiing machines, which we still have. I... No, no, it's not that one. Uh, Chuck, uh, no. No, it's a big name. They make the ski machines. You guys know what I'm talking about. Um, but at any rate, we, we went ahead and for Christmas honored ourselves with that. And that's a kicker. I got to tell you, you're sitting on a bike, <clears throat> but you're on a street in Rome or you're on a street in uh, New York, and you're riding this thing, and automatically it goes zzz, zzz, and you're going up these hills, and I'm telling you, it is an absolute hoot. There's no, rock wall on there? no, there's no, there's no uh, Dallas on there. It's just, it doesn't exist. <clears throat> okay, so you've got that. Sign up for Escaping Alzheimer's. It's free. Five-part uh, video series starts uh, February 18th. I think I asked Julia. Dr. Julia, Dr. Lee Cowden here. Was that the one, John? They came here to our uh, production facility and Dr. Josh interviewed them. This is really gonna be good. I don't know what the other doctors say. Let me tell you, let me tease you a little bit so you'll subscribe. Those of you who will watch me for a long period of time or two months know that I believe that neurotoxins are the etiology of Alzheimer's, and not only Alzheimer's, senile dementia, Parkinson's, you name it, aut uh, autism, neurotoxins, and then you're sitting there, if you're anything like me, saying, wait a minute, I'm not eating poison. Mm, you probably are. The mold that was discovered was called penicillium. The poison it makes is called penicillin. Mycotoxins are poisonous natural byproducts, degradation byproducts of yeast and fungus. Um, nobody put them there. Our exposure is totally accidental unless you watch my show. 
then you know that picking up a beer, brewer's yeast, is the fungus, and the byproduct it makes is called ethanol or alcohol. You don't think ethanol or alcohol are neurotoxic? Drink a keg and call me tonight, and let's see if we can make sense out of what you're saying. Extremely neurotoxic, and we don't drink, <clears throat> excuse me, we don't drink a beer. John, do you have the graphic of, oh, it's okay, I, um, he does, of course, John's always ready. If a woman drinks per the moderate alcohol, which is okay according to American Cancer, American Heart, you know, if a woman drinks a glass of wine an evening, what can that hurt? 58 bottles, you know what this reminds me of? 58 bottles of beer on the wall. Okay, so, I, oh, so John, I don't know what that was, but go, that, okay, so that was 58 bottles of wine. If you're drinking a glass of wine, moderate drinking, and everyone says that's okay. Women, you are drinking 58 bottles of wine a year. Nobody drinks wine for one year. You drink it for what, 10 to 20 years? Do the math. How about men? Men, two beers equals 68 gallons of beer a year. Now, <clears throat> excuse me for seeming facetious, but then you go to the doctor, well, my prostate kind of hurts, and you know what, doc, my heart's been beating a little bit too fast, and oh man, I get out of bed and my 68 gallons of mycotoxins, and not a doctor, not a doctor is going to question that, because so many of them drink, and they don't have those problems. We're all up to here with mold, a little more a six-pack or 10 rounds of penicillin, boom. We become symptomatic, if not get very, very sick, with a horrible, horrible reaction. I'm telling you, alcohol, we need to be careful of alcohol, we need to be careful of penicillin, but we need to take more flavanol. Okay, before I get to your, okay, got that, got that. Oh, I love this. Max Planck, German theoretical physicist, he won the Nobel Prize, uh, in the early 1900s, uh, he was a discoverer of energy quanta. Energy, a brilliant guy. Listen to what he once said. A new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that was familiar with it. Welcome to nutrition. Welcome to mycology. We're not convincing the older doctors that they should be changing their diet and juicing carrots and, and ginger. The doctors are dying. And new doctors coming out of medical school, and for me this is so much fun to see this 20-something, 30-something generation coming out. And guys, those kids are our kids, right? My kids are now in their 30s, I can't believe that. Those kids had moms and dads that thought through vaccinations. Hmm, you know, I don't really know. I don't really know. But we had mentors. We had books at that time, no internet. These are parents who said, no, I don't want you to have sugar. These are parents who were fairly strict with our kids' diets. And um, these are the graduating physicians now. And just because, I love this generation, millennial, just because they learned it from some guy that they have since learned is in the back pocket of the drug companies. I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm not condemning anyone. I'm just saying I think there's something morally wrong when a drug company PhD teaches our children in medical school how to prescribe statin drugs and the value of them. The road doesn't fork. When you've got a 201 cholesterol, you prescribe a statin drug because it could save his life. Could it hurt him? No, it could only... Are we drones anymore? This generation is beginning to question that. They grew up differently, and I think that's wonderful. So younger doctors, if I, if I had to go to a doctor... See, I like NDs. I like, I like Marsha, uh, our friend in Indiana. Um, I like DOs, doctors of osteopathy. I like chiropractors. I really, really do. I'm serious. I go to one. 
But an MD, an older MD, maybe not. Um, and maybe my call would be when you schedule the appointment, uh, before I make that appointment, ma'am, can you tell me, does the doctor practice nutrition? Does the doctor work with yeast and fungus? And of course, when a doctor thinks yeast, he sees a vaginal tract or he sees ringworm. You know, I mean, does he believe that systemic, that the kidneys, lungs, uh, adrenals, brain, thyroid can be impregnated with this fungus? Why are you spending 600 bucks seeing him if the answer to that is no? I think good things are happening. I think we're starting to question conventional wisdom, and I hope this show is helping you. A new scientific truth doesn't triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light. It ain't going to happen, as we say in Texas but rather because its opponents eventually die. Isn't that sad? And yet, isn't that true? And a new generation grows up that was familiar with it. Wow, what was that food pyramid all about? Somebody's idea of a joke? Okay, now, <clears throat> new study, prospective study points to phytochemicals as possibly neuroprotective agents. This was my whole lecture a few years ago. <clears throat> Higher flavanol intake was linked to lower risk of Alzheimer's dementia in a prospective cohort study of older adults. Okay, where is the operative sense? Okay, fruits and vegetables are good sources of dietary fiber, uh, and certainly this flavanol. The presence of flavanol in plants has developed, you know, years and years and years. But get this, I didn't know this. Fruits and vegetables are good sources of dietary fiber, which is metabolized in the gut, producing short-chain amino acids, medium-chain I'm sorry, short chain fatty acids. Short chain fatty acids dash antifungal. Boom. Flavanol. Boom. Antifungal, here it is, aspergillus. What was this website? I liked it. Aspergillus.org.uk. Antifungal activities of short-chain fatty acids. Listen to this. Short-chain fatty acids have fungicidal activity. It doesn't stop fungus. It kills fungus. Fungicidal activity in a wide range of molds and yeast. Fungicidal activity is rapidly and potentially non-toxic, uh, suggesting a new potential use for these or modified short-chain fatty acids as topical or inhaled antifungal agents. Isn't that cool, John? Kill most funguses, do you think? Well, so they test it. It's a good question. It's kind of like what we're doing at the medical school. You test, you can test as many as you want if your wallet's deep. Most people test for Candida albicans. It's a pathogenic yeast strain that can grow in the body. Then you get into these fusarium that makes deoxynovale or that makes uh, xerelinone and other yeasts. Right now, Candida aurus. It's a big one. It's resistant to everything. Um, so. Uh, they tested a lot of them, and this is really a good article. So you have to start thinking, wait a minute, so these flavanols ferment in the gut, and the bacteria in the gut make short-chain fatty acids. They're antifungals. Flavonoids as antifungal agents. Flavonoids are phenolic compounds. Remember what I've taught you before, and I taught this to that group of doctors. Phenolic compounds, phenols, or polyphenols, God put there to kill germs, antimicrobial, and specifically fungus. Flavonoids are phenolic compounds widely distributed in the plant kingdom. An overview of the recent papers on the antifungal activity of flavonoids, uh, which present a potential alternative to conventional fungicides, is presented. Wow. Wow. I mean... It's so major. Now, where do we get that? All plants possess phenolic compounds, but the amount may vary. It has been demonstrated that phenolic compounds have antifungal activities. This is what doctors don't know. And I think it's so sad that you get through medical training. This one we can save for another time because I know you're, you have questions. So, John, could you put up that um, graphic? As I made my breakfast this morning, I shot a picture for you, and I thought that you'd all understand this. I'm a grapefruit guy, and I've learned to really like grapefruit. 
there's two grapefruits that were, according to the source, plucked from the same tree at the same time and sold at a little tiny health food market out here. These are organic grapefruits. As you see, the one on the right is dead. The one on the left is the one I ate this morning. Mold growing through this incredible oil, grapefruit uh, seed, or grapefruit skin oil, um, amazingly antimicrobial, and yet eventually we're all gonna succumb to that mold. So my question is, and I did a little research on this, do plants have immune systems? Everything living exists as long as it can fend itself against the bad guys who come in. There's passive immunity and there's active immunity. You and I have active immunity. Plants have, don't have active immunity, they have passive immunity, okay? Humans, and I did a little study and I want to help you. This is going to sound technical, don't let it be, but just close your eyes while I'm saying it. Humans have an active antigen antibody immune system. <clears throat> this leads to the formation of what we call little microchips called immune complexes. <clears throat> immune complexes must be removed from the tissues and kept from accumulating in our circulation and forming deposits throughout the body. Otherwise, they can lead to immune, autoimmune diseases. I don't believe that. But they do, and they're the doctors. These little microchips, so you have a type of white blood cell, perfectly round. You have a T cell and a B cell, lymphocytes they're called. T cells, the body's first line, you know, helper, killer, the, the first line of defense we have. B cells make a mirror image, so in goes a chip. You chew up some apple, and you've got gut leakage, and the white blood cells called B cell lymphocytes uh, make a mirror image of that little tiny wire that comes through the gut that's apple, rendering it harmless. Isn't our immune system amazing? Now, once you have that <clears throat> antigen being apple, antigen can be animal dander, it can be milk if you're allergic to it, peanut, it can be mold, that's an antigen. The coronavirus is currently an antigen, okay? What they want to do with it is uh, induce antibodies from it. Well, our B cells, so we inhale it, uh-oh, dangerous. Now our B cells are turned on and they make mirror images of this coronavirus. We call those immune complexes. They are filtered out by a system, I'm, I'm telling you, the more I study this, John, the more I see the creation is amazing. These are filtered out. Boy, I better get to work. Okay, I'm with you, John. Wow. You guys want to talk and I'm going to do that. They're filtered out by an amazing system we have called the reticuloendothelial system. It comprises a lot of cells, a lot of organs. Bottom line is they're all phagocytic. They gobble up. Okay, no more immune complexes. Gone. Let's get them out of our body now. Now, I will give you this. When they look at a cancer, they might see, wow, what's all that white stuff there? Those are immune complexes. Why weren't they filtered out? You know, it's just so frustrating for me to try and put all this together. By the way, flavanols, a class of flavonoids, phytonutrients, are found in plant-based foods. And uh, the most amazing amount, the highest amount, are in uh, red onions, the skin, the red two shells, and green apples. 97% of the green apple skin, flavanols. Was Kaufman smart in putting green apples on that diet back when I probably couldn't spell green apples? Okay, we're going to let this go. Beth, by the way, Beth the other day, I think she's watching. Just for fun, every time I try and watch this, and it gets close to 5 p.m. Eastern time, my dog starts bringing me things. Napkins, paper plates, toys, bones, trying to tell me it's her supper time. Tonight she's getting some sweet potato and broccoli in her no grain dog food, thanks to your show. Slowly trying to transition her to foods away from kibbles. Uh, smart. I think that's smart. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Susie, good uh, question. What about mushrooms? What about fermented foods? In, uh, this was dramatic. In his book, Dr. Costantini's books, 
on atherosclerosis and I think in the cancer books also, he talked about the mycotoxins in mushrooms. Now, I just had a doctor ask me this about mushrooms, so let me, let me answer both of these. Mm. Doug's hypotheses, that's all we have, folks. Everybody's in love with mushrooms today, except the death cap, you know, which the mycotoxins in the death cap will kill you within a day. You have to be careful of those. So don't forage, you know, don't go into some of these hills and pick mushrooms and light a fire and make mushrooms. Be very, very careful. What is a mycologist? I will tell you, a mycologist is a guy who earned a PhD degree in mycology, the study of fungus. How I wish, Mike Rinaldi is one of the smartest guys I know. Uh, Mike Rinaldi took that education into studying human diseases. He's a mycologist. Elizabeth Moore Landacker, Dr. Elizabeth Moore Landacker, took that education and overlaid it with human disease. But many mycologists or foragers are, are mushroom people. How would someone spend eighty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000 for a mycology degree and then study mushrooms? Here's the good news. We know that there are some mushroom and mushroom components that are medicinal. What do I mean by that? They can behave as medicines. Well, how can that be if these books, these older books, are talking about mushrooms being so toxic? And I have talked, I have a friend, some of you guys know him, in L.A., who is a doctor who has studied abroad. And abroad, he learned, and he talked to me about this decades ago. Doug, I know your feelings on mushrooms, but I got to tell you, I've seen it clinically in hospitals where they study these things in Korea and in China and Japan and so forth, where they are using fragments of these mushrooms as immunostimulants uh, and people have recovered from very serious diseases. Another thing, if I were Rush Limbaugh, I'd consider. Why? Because I think he may have a lung, a pulmonary fungal disease. Doug's hypothesis. The rules that govern homeopathy say treat like for like. If you've got a systemic fungal condition and you begin chewing up, or uh, I'm told by my doctor friend they actually do IV mushrooms now, and you get better, First of all, you have opened the door to homeopathy being a valid science. Second of all, if I'm right on my hypotheses, many people, most people, would be able to eat bacterial fermented foods, kombucha, and feel great. But some people would drink a kombucha and go, oh, and vomit and feel horrible. I contend the ones who take mushrooms therapeutically and who drink kefir and who drink kombucha, see these are bacterial and uh, yeast ferments. I don't believe in yeast ferment. Yeast ferment means ethanol, alcohol. True, some of the problems they've had with kefir and kombucha deal with the percentage of alcohol. Kids can walk into a health food store and buy kombucha, suck it down. What did we used to do? When I was out of boot camp, I went to uh, medical training, and the guys at night, oh, I know, would buy uh, cough medicine because it was a certain percentage alcohol and drink it, and sure enough, we'd be playing cards or something, and they'd seem like they were looped. Cough syrup is apparently gone, and the new thing now is kombucha. Ah, uh, 2%, but isn't that a beer? And so, if mushrooms work, I think the reason they may work is they have confirmed the etiology of your health problem. Be it lymphoma, breast cancer, be it diabetes, I think the reason these things work is you have awoken a sleeping giant. Okay? Um, like for like, treat like with like. If you've got mushrooms growing out throughout your body, then a mushroom extract or a yeast extract might be quite good. I recall reading studies, oh, there's a study I still have over in my office, of, uh, of course, the medical uh, organizations recommending alcohol. Because they took people who were really, really sick, who had never drunk, and they drank a beer, and things began to get better. Blood work began to get better. That kind of makes sense to me. It's a fungal mycotoxin treating a mycotoxin disease.
So I'm sorry to take so long and dwell on that, Susie, but I wanted everyone to know. Uh, Lactobacillus acidophilus, uh, sauerkraut, no yeast, bacteria, love. My probiotics, no yeast, bacteria, okay? Um, alcohol, no bacteria, yeast. Kombucha, bacteria and yeast. Love the bacteria. Kefir, bacteria and yeast. Um, they're popular and you gotta give it to people. They're leaning toward things that work. They go in now buy a case of kombucha and they keep drinking, it settles their stomach. It's really helpful for their symptoms. God bless them, folks. That's what this is all about. Not condemning someone, don't ever let me do that. Don't ever drink alcohol because one beer, I had an employee that worked with me in a laboratory one time. Oh, she's, I don't know, mid-twenties, who had migraine headaches so bad, and her husband was a PhD. And one day she came to work and I said, how are you feeling today? And she said, really good. And I said, great. And she said, we went out with friends last night and I drank two glasses of wine and that takes my headaches away for a day or so. Hair of the dog, treating with yeast would work, theoretically, if the etiology, if the cause is yeast. I think it's important that you all know the name of my TV show. Know the cause, okay? Thank you, Susie, great question as we uh, jump off. This is Diane, hi Doug, thanks for all you do to inform us. I love doing this. What do you think about ganglions? Yeah, could they be fungal or do you have any testimonies on them? None. Ganglions, is it here where it's growing? Uh, it's kind of interesting. One time I saw this happen, I couldn't believe it. it had nothing to do with medicine. I was on a baseball team. Uh, when I got back from Vietnam, I joined a baseball team and had a wonderful time, a great bunch of guys. Uh, the center fielder had a big ganglion cyst on his wrist. You're not going to believe this. The pitcher said, you know, there's a cure for that told him to take his mitt, they're made of leather, off and put it on his thing. And he grabbed a bat, wham! I knew that guy for uh, Jerry. I knew this guy for a couple of years. It never came back. I don't get it. Knew the cause. He will never know the cause of why it popped up. We tend to think a center fielder, you know, he's always out there, the long high balls, hundreds of feet in the air, boom. Just like these problems people are getting right now, you know, who are on computers all day, the wrist problems. Um, it, vitamin, uh, uh, vitamin B6 uh, seems to help those tremendously. You might try vitamin B6, do they, six, do they have a, a fungal etiology? Dan, I don't know, I don't know. The only one I ever saw cured for two years <clears throat> was someone who took a baseball bat to it we were crazy back then. Okay, uh, Roberta. Thank you, uh, Diane. Roberta. My doctor says I have, is that point, point 0.4 more of uric acid in my system. Should I try and get my body in a more alkaline state? Okay, so does anybody know this is huge? Where does uric acid come from? Have you, Rebecca, or Roberta, I'm sorry, Ever watch TV and seen the guy with the stethoscope, the actor, or the real doctor, uh, saying, well, here's a new, you know, gout medication. Gout happens because of uric acid. Uric acid causes gout. The genius, Roberta, isn't going to be the guy that drones that over and over again, as a medical school would have taught him. The genius is going to come from the person that questions that. Uric acid. Okay, I know that uric acid makes gout. What makes uric acid? You know what it does? Brewer's yeast. Brewer's yeast. A lot of us are eating it. Uh, more are drinking it. Gout used to be called in the 1950s and 60s, used to be called the beer drinker's disease. And now we know why. We didn't know then. We knew that people who drank beer ended up with toes. This is post-World War II. A lot of drinkers. My dad was in that field. 
uh, the, the military coming home, and what could they do legally? They could drink, you know, and so they drank. And a lot of ex-military had gout. Now, if you understand where I'm coming from, you don't need, you don't need to drink alcohol. If, in fact, fungi produce uric acid, you could be getting that fungi from a moldy room. You could be getting that fungi from medications. You can be eating corn. Corn is very often impregnated with mold. Yep, corn here in the U.S. And we're able to quantify it, not in our food supply. You can't open a can of corn and take it to a hospital and say, I want to test this for mycotoxins. We test it in our feed supply. Feed is what animals eat. Food is what humans eat. But we then eat the animal. So hay and corn and other foods, wheat, that animals eat are impregnated with this mold, U.S., in the U.S., then we eat the animal. Could it be that meat causes gout? There's some question about that right now. To the extent that our animals are loaded with carbohydrates, corn, wheat, hay, and then sacrificed, and then a, a known estrogenic mycotoxin that mimics human estrogen. We are injecting into cows now so they grow fat quickly and we can bang them on the head and they're gone. Gee, that's funny, Doug. I've never drunk, but I have gout. How many times have our doctors looked at a liver enzyme assay, SGOT, SGPT, GGT, and looked at a, a, your blood test results and said, I need to ask you something. How much do you drink, Roberta? I, I haven't drunk since I was 24 years old. I'm 50 now. Well, I don't think that's the truth because these indications don't lie. Folks, these are mycotoxins to the extent alcohol is a mycotoxin. Trust me, we're getting into mycotoxins far and above beyond alcohol. If you inhale today, you're inhaling some mold. This is where our body makes antibodies to it and renders us safe. B cells, right, make antibodies to it and render us safe. So we can no longer shake our finger at alcohol. Yep, brewer's yeast is one of the things that makes uric acid. Who has studied um, fusarium? Who has studied uh, candida for the making of brewer's yeast? Here's what we do know. Sometimes fungus makes uric acid. What makes the uric acid is where you want to go. So. Fungi tend to grow in an, alkaline, or in an acid environment better than in an alkaline environment. That's a general statement because sometimes they don't. Um, but I want you to know, turning your body alkaline, greens versus grains. More greens, fewer grains. Acid, alkaline, greens. Follow along, Roberta. If I had this problem, I'd, I'd look for mold in my home. Smokers, the aspergillus mold, because what do you do with a cigarette? You dip it in sugar, you got your tobacco, you roll it up tight, then you seal it with a, uh, I remember, never forget my dad used to peel that, it looked like tin foil off the top of cigarettes, push from the bottom, put one in his mouth, and light one off the other. Camel cigarettes is what my dad used to do. Cigarettes are notoriously impregnated with fungus then what's lung cancer all about? Cigarettes or fungus? Dr. A.V. Costantini told me at a symposium in Canada many years ago, he's with the World Health Organization. He didn't tell me, he told all 50 of us in the room, that uh, cigarettes, uh, tobacco doesn't cause cancer. You should have seen, you could have heard a pin drop in that room. But he mentored so many of us. And he said, no, I've got to tell you, if you roll your own, you go out to Virginia, you." pull up the tobacco and roll your own and smoke it, uh, you're not going to die of lung disease. It's the mycotoxins in the cigarettes, okay? So look deep inside, uh, Roberta, where are you getting in touch with mycotoxins, with fungus that make mycotoxins, okay? And do, I would work on turning your body into a more alkaline state. <laughs> this is a good one, Lisa, and I swear we're going we're gonna to dwell on this because it needs to be dwelled on. She says, I have always thought that most cancer diagnoses are fungal related, parasitic related, right or wrong. That is how I feel. I wish I had more information. I wish my doctor had knowledge of this. In the past uh, 40 years, 
there are probably a dozen or two doctors that I have introduced to this and their stories. If you guys could just see, let's see who that was. Oh, this is a doc, this is one of them in San Diego. Um, if you guys only knew how, Lisa, you're dead on. I don't know if you're a brand new viewer, welcome. We need so many viewers like you because starting Thursday, for an hour and a half on Thursday, I'm gonna expound on this. Do you know the biggest wow in all of medicine happened four years ago, Lisa, and nobody saw it? Four years ago, a doctor discovered testing hundreds of products what was knocking out cancer cells and preventing them from metastasizing inside human bodies. Guess what it was? The toenail fungus drug called Sporinox. By the way, its sister, called Lamisil, has done the same thing. Even Nystatin <clears throat> has known, these are antifungal drugs, has been known to inhibit fungal growth or induce apoptosis, uh, kill, burst the cancer cell. You bring up, and Lisa, I'm going to dedicate Thursday's show to you. I've always felt that most cancer diagnoses are fungal-related, parasitic-related. Fungi are human parasites. Right or wrong? Right. That is how I feel. You're right. I wish I had more information. I'm going to bend your ear. Can I just tell you before I go away, Lisa, or before I say goodbye to you? Um, a decade ago, <clears throat> I had my finger on the pulse of exactly what you're talking about. I had written a book. It just flew off the shelves, the fungus link. Oh, by the way, I'll wait till Thursday. Um, <clears throat> and studies came out one after the other <clears throat> on breast cancer. And these were the studies. First one came out, said, hmm, we don't know why, but antibiotic intake seems to correlate with increased breast cancer risk. Hmm, we don't know why. Second study starchy carbohydrates, as they go up, so does breast cancer risk. Third study, alcohol of any kind. Didn't matter as tequila, red wine, you know, alcohol of any kind, as drinking goes up, so does risk of breast cancer. The genius, well, he's not a genius. The guy who put this together is not a genius. Wait a minute, aren't antibiotics, mycotoxins, the molds penicillium? The mycotoxin, the poison, is penicillin. There are now hundreds of derivatives that we're all being put on. Uh, alcohol, Burge yeast. It's mycotoxin, ethanol, alcohol. No genius there. Starchy rice, potatoes, right? Starchy carbohydrates, sugar in your diet increases your risk of, of breast cancer. Now you put all those together. I don't know about you guys, but when I was in my 20s, I probably took, I know I did, uh, took antibiotics because I kept getting, you know, infected somewhere or the other. <clears throat> so I was on antibiotics from time to time. Uh, my 20s, coming home from Vietnam, I was 21 when I came home, were a bit of a blur uh, in my young 20s because I drank, <clears throat> and I drank more than I should have because it calmed me. I wasn't worried that a boom would go off and scare me. Alcohol subdued me. Starch, El Tarascos, down in Manhattan Beach. I was there all the time because they had a $1 burrito, just filled with beans and rice and flour tortilla. Um, and we ate there, you know, most nights. So when you think about when, when we're most vulnerable for breast cancer, prostate cancer, any of these things, it's when we're younger and our lifestyles are smoking cigarettes, Eating peanuts, eating starch. Don't feel so well, doctor. No shortage of doctors that'll hand you a mycotoxin. Such good questions. <clears throat> I know some of you folks, uh, you know that tonight I'll try and get in front of a computer after I get home and get some of tomorrow's shows written. Um, so I'll try and answer the ones I don't get to at night. Folks, this is an open forum. This is where I need you, you need me. Um, and we talk about things that you're not gonna hear in a doctor's office. Had I not worked for various doctors for decades, none of this information would be out there. And I made a pact with the man upstairs. I didn't want to die, become an old guy and die 
without planting seeds and some very smart minds. And that's where you guys come in. Cindy says, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Cindy, always Cindy. She's just great. Uh, okay, so Lori. Hi, Doug. I have listened to you for years and now follow your diet, supplements, etc. I tell everyone I'm in contact that you have all the answers. I've listened to Rush Limbaugh since he started in the 80s and he announced yesterday uh, he has advanced lung cancer. They're going to discuss this course of treatment. Would it be possible for him to contact you if you could send some form of contact info uh, to him? I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much for all you do. God bless you. I appreciate all the information that you dispensed us. Uh, Lori, part of the reason we actually, I think most of you guys would be shocked to know how many people enjoy this. And we have a leg up on other people because I have a television show that goes into 200 countries. Um, a lot of people watch this show. I missed the human, the intimacy when you do a television show of really talking to people and being able to answer questions like you have here. I miss that. So years ago, the brains that be here in the studio said, why don't you start up something and we'll start, before we go to Periscope, and other, we'll go to YouTube, we'll go to Facebook, and we'll see if 100 people want to see this. Um, and they do. A lot of people want to see this. And I thank you. I'm humbled. I'm hoping one of you, if God wills it, one of you will have contact information with Rush Limbaugh. You don't win all these wars. It's not fair for me to say everyone with a fungal condition will survive. Why? At stage four, this means his lung cancer has now metastasized to other areas, sometimes spine, bones, liver. And then with fungus in those tissues, fungus protects itself in a little rubbery ball that looks like a cancer tumor. And it grows and grows and grows. And as it grows in your body, it occludes blood flow. It stops blood flow. We all have millions of nerves in our body and fungus pushes on those. Before you know it, we are doubled over in pain. We can't eat, we can't drink water, we chew on ice cubes. Um, our, our hearts stop. It's an ugly, ugly, horrible disease. At the time you're in stage four, this cancer, whatever it is, maybe fungus, maybe cancer, has metastasized through your body. Can you then arrest it? I don't know. But like I tell everybody, every time I do this show, what have we to lose? What's chemotherapy going to do? So, and then you think of the miracles. Who is the president? Um, Jimmy Carter is alive today. Had brain cancer years ago. He's alive today. So we can't shake our fingers at all allopathic models. We simply can't. I don't know what the five-year survival rate is of cancer. I have no idea. It's not great but I think it's getting better with some of these immune building drugs that are coming on the market right now. I just hope, like you, Lori, that he is in great hands. And I think that's what we can pray for, is the rush finds the right doctors. Uh, because I'd love to talk with him. If I could bend his ear for 10 minutes, I think he'd subscribe to this. <clears throat> okay, uh, Sam says, sorry, Sam, I missed this. Doug, please help. Number one, my sister is looking for help with appendicitis. What supplements would pull this out of her? She has this very sluggish lymph system. Let me address that. Some, especially with an appendicitis, what do the appendix do? They direct probiotics into the gut. We didn't know why they were there 50 years ago. Now we know that the appendix weren't some afterthought that the creator said, oop, no, let's put some appendix in there. You don't want what we used to call in surgery a hot appy. You don't want the appendix to burst because she could then die of septicemia, sepsis, a bacteria throughout her body. If I had a bad appendicitis in a heartbeat, I'd get it taken out. Then I'd change my diet that likely contributed to that appendix <clears throat> becoming so inflamed. 
Uh, number two, please help with granddaughter idiopathic arthritis, both knees and now elbow. Wow. Okay, do you know what idiopathic means? I know Sam does. Do you guys know? We say idiopathic purpura, idiopathic um, uh, tinnitus. Idiopathic means we don't have any idea. It's the medical way of saying we don't have any idea. And then there's another word I just love. It's called iatrogenic. Iatrogenic is doctor or hospital or medication induced. Didn't have that problem before I went to that doctor and started that medication. Idiopathic and iatrogenic. Two words you need to know. She's on, this is fascinating. She's on Diflucan and Istat for a high level of yeast, double normal. She's on Kaufman 1 mostly. Do you have a pediatrician, mold yeast dietitian that can take her to? Mom wants a doctor's help. Thank you so much for all you do. Uh, Sam, will you, uh, will you private message me and tell me where you're located, and I'll see if I can get on the phone and get someone that will see her. I'm, okay, if she started on Diflucan and Nystatin and she became worse, bingo. You awaken a sleeping giant when you begin to kill massive amounts of yeast. Idiopathic arthritis, there's a type of arthritis that I'd like to introduce you to. Google it tonight. Mycotic, M-Y-C-O-T-I-C. Mycotic arthritis. Everything you read is going to say very rare. Not. I think very common, but never factored into the diagnosis. Mycotic arthritis is fungal arthritis. This young girl has high levels, double the levels of yeast and fungus in her body. You don't think her joints are impregnated with this yeast? Whoever put her on Diflucan and Istatin is brilliant. Yes, I will try and find you if you'll let me know. Uh, Isella, hey Doug, I watched you on TV for years. Now I find you here. I would love to have a book of recipes of an everyday homemade meal that would make me live healthier. Any, I, I need any ideas. Isella, um, private message me tonight with your last name and your mailing address, and uh, I will sign that book. We're going to be snowed in, we think, tomorrow, right, John? Yeah, we're probably going to be snowed in tomorrow, so I won't be able to get... Oh, what a fun day. Live at knowthecause.com. Finally, Jaden, what do you think about marijuana? Um... It's a plant that God put here that man abused uh, in the 1960s. Um, because it's a plant, it has medicinal properties. Remember what we talked about tonight? We talked about um, the ability of plants to have antimicrobial properties. They do. And hemp particularly. Now the THC component is what I think will eventually, in the right dosage, help people with... Uh, neurological problems, I really do. But the CBD seems to be able to help people with epilepsy, with type 1, type 2, pettit, grand mal seizures. So I'm very bullish on marijuana. Um, does joint pain come from fungus? What about sinus? Can we talk? A, both of them are known to be linked to cancer, or to be linked to uh, fungus. Oh, this is so good, you guys. Thank you for these great questions. Thank you for joining me. Tell a friend about this. Let's get thousands of more people in here. And then Thursday, if you'll join me at 2.30 Central Time, Dallas Time, if you'll join me, let's talk about the big C. Okay, let's talk about cancer. Let's give you some facts that you can be more prepared to prevent this in your life. God bless you guys. I'll see you then. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir.